Hi folks, welcome back to Physics with Captain Rod. Uh, the purpose of this video is to uh, give an example of how to use angular momentum in an impact. And also I want to talk a little bit about why we want to use angular momentum. So what we're looking at here, you know, imagine this bar uh, made of, I don't know, metal or wood or something that's pinned here and free to rotate about this axis right here. In this example, we're going to assume this bar is 4 kilograms and 2 meters long. And then somebody throws, I don't know, some sort of sticky ball at it. I, I call this VP1, which stands for putty. You know, imagine a big block of uh, like silly putty or something at 20 meter per second. Now this putty is going to hit the end of this block. And what we're going to try to calculate here is to what angle this bar will swing up to after impact. All right. So, um, moment to get rid of this little gobbledygook. All right. Now, our first picture here is showing the putty just before impact. I'm going to call this picture one. Another very important picture is going to be after the putty hits the bar. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to clone that bar. Draw another picture of it. Now, even though I've moved it over, the bar has not physically you know, this point has not moved to the right. This is just going to be a new time frame here. And I'm also going to clone the uh, putty. This is now stuck to it. Oops. Oh, there we go. And at this instant in time now, this entire thing is going to be rotating now. So I'm going to go ahead and give this an angular velocity vector. And I'm going to call this omega 2. So this is picture 1, and this is going to be my picture 2. Now, my picture 3, this bar is going to rotate up to a certain uh, position. And I'm not exactly sure what. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, clone the bar with the putty. And again, I want to include the putty here. All right, so this is going to be my picture three. However, whoops, we're going to assume it has rotated up to some sort of angle here. So my picture three might look something like this. Now, how far to rotate it? Well, I don't really know. I'm just going to do this and then pick, clean my picture up a little bit here. So again, this is still connected. However, in my third picture, it's not going to be rotating anymore. So let me get rid of this angular velocity vector. So this is going to be my picture three. I've probably drawn better pictures, but that's good enough. All right, so picture one, just before impact. Picture two is just an instant after impact. Putty is now stuck to this bar, and this thing is going to rotate up. Uh, in picture two, we do have an angular velocity. Picture three now, the bar has rotated up uh, to some angle theta, which I don't know. Now, one thing I'd like to point out, I make these examples up off the top of my head. Conceivably, this putty is moving fast enough that this might swing up, you know, above this line up into this quadrant and maybe even all the way around. And I'll, I'll talk about in the video how we know whether that's happening or not. For now, I'm just going to assume it swings up some amount and uh, call that good. All right. Now we've got to talk about what concepts to apply between one and two. So putty is hitting the bar. Um, when you're dealing with impacts, momentum is the preferred concept. However, there's something that really needs to be understood. In this picture, we have a linear momentum equal to mass of the putty times 20 meter per second to the right. When the ball hits the putty, if we think about the forces exerted at the pin, that's going to create a horizontal force to the left. Now, in addition to the vertical force, which is already, I'll put an FY here, uh, uh, holding that up. And during that impact time, you know, this force is going to be there just for a small fraction of a time, but it is there for that time. So that force right there represents a net impulse to the left during impact. So long story short, linear momentum, like mass times velocity, is not conserved for this impact because of an external force that appears here at the pin in that little maybe hundredth of a second time frame when that ball hits the bar. 
That force, however, creates no angular uh, uh, force. Torque is what I want. That force creates no torque about that point. Therefore, angular momentum is still conserved. Force changes your linear momentum. Torque changes your angular momentum. So we're going to start this problem by writing an equation that's going to be conservation of angular momentum about this point. And again, that's going to be from 1 to 2. The angular momentum in picture 1. So the putty has a linear momentum equal to mass of the putty times VP1. And I can turn that into an angular momentum just by multiplying by this perpendicular distance. Again, it's a lot like turning a force into a torque. You multiply by perpendicular distance. So that's equal to just the length of this bar. So this quantity right here represents the angular momentum of the putty about this axis. Picture two. I'm just going to treat this like a rotating body now. The angular momentum is going to equal the moment of inertia of that body times the angular velocity in picture two. And again, we can equate these because um, during impact, you know, there's a force on the putty to the left, force on the bar to the right. Well, those forces add to zero anyway external impulse here that does change the linear momentum but that force does not create any torque about that point so the angular momentum is still conserved that's why we can put that guy there all right now let's talk about that moment of inertia we've got a bar and the putty the putty it's pretty much as simple as this the moment of inertia treating this like a point mass mass about a point is going to be mass of the putty times this distance squared. So I'm just going to put L squared there. So that represents the moment of inertia of the putty about this point. And now I just need to tack on something for the bar here. Now the moment of inertia of a bar axis through one end is one third ML squared. Now that mass is the mass of the bar. And then times the angular velocity picture two. So this expression uh, would yield the um, or is the angular momentum conservation for uh, this problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put numbers everywhere here, and then what I'll do is uh, get that solved for omega too. The units are consistent, so I'm going to put note consistent units. So the putty's mass, this is 2 kilograms times 20 meter per second, and that bar is 2 meters, equals, right, moment of inertia. Mass of the putty, 2 kilograms times 2 meters squared, there's your ml squared, plus one-third mass of the bar, four kilograms, times its length squared. And I guess I'll close that parenthesis and then times omega-2 here. So we can now solve this for the omega-2. I'll store that up there. And I think I'll do here is take a moment, keep the video short. I'll pause this, calculate it, and come back. Okay, so I'm back. That was quick. Okay, so what I got was 6 rad per second, or about 6 radian per second. I'm just going to run that one more time here. 4 times 20 is 80, divided by this, which is going to be 8 plus 16 thirds. 6, yep. So solving that for omega 2, I get 6 radian per second. All right. Now what do we do here? Well... Let's uh, take our momentum equation, and maybe I can just shrink it down and not have to get rid of it. We'll just scale that down, move it out of the way. All right, now from 2 to 3. From 2 to 3, this is an energy problem. We basically have a rotational kinetic energy in picture 2 and a potential energy in picture 3. So I'm going to write out the work energy theorem. Uh, PE2 plus KE2 plus work equals PE3 plus KE3. Now, let's talk potential energies. Um, the potential energies are going to depend on where we measure from. In these rotational problems, I'm kind of fond of putting my datum at the rotation point here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a datum right through there. And what I'm going to do now is take both things into account. So the putty's potential energy is going to be minus mass of the putty G times L, minus because the putty is down below the datum in picture two. 
all right, the bar. Um, you measure potential energy to the center of mass, which is for a bar at its geometric center. So the potential energy of the bar is going to be minus mass of the bar times g times L over 2. So this quantity represents the PE2 term. KE2 term is going to be 1 half the moment of inertia. Now I've already calculated that moment of inertia here. I'm just going to copy that down. Mass of the putty times L squared plus 1 third mass of the bar times L squared and then times omega 2 squared. So there's my KE2 term. 1 half I omega squared. And again, I'm getting that I, that moment of inertia. I just copied it right down from this term. I had calculated it earlier for the momentum part. The work term is zero. And again, I'll come back and talk about why in a minute. All right. Equals. Okay. Uh, the PE3 term. So the putty is sitting here. Its distance below the datum we can get from this triangle right there. That is the distance below the datum adjacent to theta. So that's going to equal L cosine theta. And that term is negative because it's still down below the datum. So we're going to have minus L cosine theta uh, times mg, I guess, times mass of the putty times g. Normally I would write that mgh. Just happened to write the h first there. So that's the potential energy term again for the putty position 3. And then the potential energy now for the bar, position 3, measuring potential energy there to the center. The distance we need we can get from this triangle, whoops, right there. That kind of squirrely distance there is the height difference we need for the potential energy term. The hypotenuse of that triangle is L over 2. So the um, distance we need is L over 2 cosine theta, and again that potential energy is negative, so we're going to have minus mass of the bar G times L over 2 cosine theta. And lastly, the KE3 term is 0 because in picture 3 it's not moving yet. All right. So what I need to do here is I want to go through and put numbers everywhere I can into this equation and then we'll try to solve that for theta. I'm going to pause the video because it looks like that might take a little bit. So bear with me. All right folks I'm back here and <clears throat> let me explain to you where, uh, where I'm at with this. So what I did is I just put numerical values everywhere here that I had and calculated a value and I got 20, 122 joule out of that. Uh, I left the units off because I don't need them for now. Right hand side I did the same thing. I put numerical values here everywhere and factored the cosine theta out and when I did that I got negative 78. All right. When we take this equation now and we try to solve this you're going to get an error out of it and the reason is because when you divide by this negative 178 what we would have, if you give me a moment, is negative 1.56 equals cosine theta. Well this equation doesn't have a solution. Reason? Uh, the cosine function is bound between minus 1 and 1. Now you might say well we worked the problem wrong or there's a mistake. And I, I would say no. Uh, we just need to interpret our results. Here's the possibilities here. Had we gotten an angle out of this between 0 and 90, our picture would have been just perfect and everything would have worked out fine and, and we would have been happy. But, you know, as this thing's speed goes up, in the end this angle theta gets larger and larger and larger. And it's conceivable for this theta to be bigger than 90. That would just occur when this bar swings up into this region. What would have happened in that case is we would have gotten something like cosine theta equals maybe negative 0.3 or negative 0.4 or maybe negative 0.5. Had we gotten something like that, this would have a solution. Your angle theta would come out bigger than 90, and we would know that this would have swung up here into this quadrant, which is perfectly fine. Again, we'd be done. As this speed gets higher and higher and higher, eventually this would actually have enough rotation speed to swing all the way around. And that's what apparently is happening in this case. It turns out that there's just enough speed here that our position 3, it makes it all the way around and keeps going. Even at the highest position, when that bar is straight up, it still should have had some speed, which means it would have had a kinetic energy term, which we don't have. 
Now, I want to keep the video short, but here's what I could do. I could make my position 3 vertical, um, use the appropriate heights for the potential energy, put a Ke3 term in, and then calculate this thing's rotation rate from the vertical. I just have to rewrite this entire equation, um, except that these potential energies are going to be with this thing rotated straight up. So for example, for the putty, the potential energy would be positive MGL, because the putty would be a distance L above the datum. This term here would now be positive MGL over 2, because the bar um, this distance is L over 2, and this point would be up here above the datum. And then I would include a 1 half M, I'm sorry, a 1 half I omega squared for the kinetic energy term. I could then use the moment of inertia I found before and solve that for the angular speed. And that would tell me the angular speed in picture 3. I'm not going to bother doing that. Um, the point of this video was how to work a um, angular momentum type of problem, and we did that. And then we wrote a work energy equation, and although it didn't yield an answer exactly like uh, I wanted, which is perfectly fine, I did know that was a possibility and, and pointed that out at the beginning of the problem. Again, I made these number, numbers up off the top of my head. I do know, I guess I would say, to answer my question, I wanted to know the angle theta. Well, this thing is going to go all the way up till theta equals 180 and keep going round and round. So that's actually the answer uh, to the question I posed. So I think that's good enough for this video. Uh, I hope it I hope this video helps demonstrate how to apply these concepts. Have a great day.